Nadia Ahmed Abdallah. I am the youngest chief administrative secretary in the Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth Affairs. It's literally equivalent to a deputy minister, it's just given a different name. And what my job is, or what I'm in charge of, is to really deputize the cabinet secretary, um, advise him on matters to do with youth, matters to do with innovation, matters to do with technology, um, go to certain events, um, or even represent the cabinet secretary in certain events, and just really interact with young people, and also advise um, the CS, advise the president on the different things that that are happening around Kenya when it comes to young people. So basically I'm a young person representative on a national platform serving you all. As you can see I'm wearing a t-shirt written Kenya Nimimi. So Kenya Nimimi started off as just a hashtag that I came up with when I was when I started in government because as soon as I got appointed I had to move to Nairobi and my life changed. So being a person who's worked a lot with the community and being a person who's also worked briefly in the county government, I was having a challenge and a struggle to actually um, fulfill my duties when it comes to a national government platform. And so I sat down and thought about it with my team, thought about something that will excite young people by the same time educate them, inform them, but also represent them. And hence I came up with Kenya Nimi, which means Kenya is me. Basically it's a concept that I built to really tell young people that the duty um, is within yourself. Like, you will be angry with a lot of things. You won't like how systems work sometimes. You won't like how things are or how you're represented. But it's also up to you as a young person to actually come out and say, I don't like it like this and voice out your opinion. And so what I did is I just pitched to the cabinet secretary who then spoke to the president. And in 10 months time in my appointment, we managed to launch Kenya Nimimi with His Excellency the President. And the highlight was he was able to have uh, intergenerational dialogue with young people. We had about a thousand to two thousand young people who came from across Kenya and they spoke to the president and it was a fun affair but at the same time it was very educating because after that event I went across the 47 counties but regionally met young people with other partners and we kind of grew the campaign into something educative but fun for young people to have. So up until today where we are, we just graduated our first cohort of Kenya Nimimi and we are yet to see. If I come back to government, Kenya Nimimi will continue. If not, then Kenya Nimimi will now be on a community level. To see, to see owe to kiwa watoto, to malize masomo yetu, lakini ukibe hatika na mwenyezi mungu wa kupatia hiyo baraka ya kupata Soulmate wako wa maisha Jameni usikae Hata kama mutakuwa muna live kwa rumu moja mukiwa wawili hapo muanze hapo mkue pamoja One highlight I'll tell you is that I actually love my job I enjoy my job and I don't see it as a job, by the way. I see it as an extra addition to my life. And the reason I say that is because I'm very passionate about young people, I'm passionate about children, I'm passionate about women. And so most of the things that I do, my typical day would be me waking up um, at five, of course, to pray. Um, and then I try sometimes to work out, but it doesn't work <laughs> because, you know, sometimes you get so tired. But then it depends. So because of COVID, we have two different dynamics. If I'm working from home, um, I'll make sure I have my breakfast, then I hop into meetings. But if I'm in the office, I usually have laid out my meetings that I need to do um, and interact with different people. One thing about me, I have an open door policy. So I meet a lot of young people in my office. And if I'm not in the office, I'm in a county, I'm actually either meeting with them under trees or dancing with them or representing them in different places and institutions and events. So it's a fun day filled with everything. And then I go back home. I'm, uh, I like binge watching series uh, and, and cartoon mostly, but um, animated, animated movies. And yeah, that's my typical day. And weekends, I'm just like a normal youth, like young person. I, I go out with my friends, I go out dancing and yeah.
just have fun. Um, so basically there are two elements uh, when it comes to my job that I love. Number one, it's really the openness and the freedom to interact with my cabinet secretary and be able to tell him my opinions about certain programs, certain projects or whether things are working or not. I think that's a highlight because it's important because it just signifies that I'm not just in this position because of, you know, the vibe and the hype, but I'm actually in this position and I have a boss that actually listens and um, gives me advice and, and gives me a chance to be able to implement what I, I want and what I believe and get feedback. And number two, I think it's sitting in spaces where there are people of influence. When you're talking about developing partners, when you're talking about private sector, but when you're also talking about individuals. I think the fact that I'm able to voice out opinions on behalf of young people and women, it actually has given me more confidence and more power to be able to move, shift, and change things. So like um, I sit, I'm the co-chair of the Youth Sounding Board for UNDP. So we are able to see what UNDP is doing for young people and then push and give advice whether or not this is something that works or not. So it's it's really a lot of things and I think it's very important if a young person is in a certain space and you're given the chance to voice out and represent people well, it actually boosts you and boosts your career to be able to be a change maker. A bit about my background, I was born and raised in Mombasa, Kenya. I'm a typical Swahili girl from there. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to, to do both um, systems, the 844 system and the IGCSE system. Um, I studied in a school called Nyali Primary School, uh, where I did my KCPE. Actually, by there, you know, a lot of people thought or think that I got really high marks. I got 350, <laughs> so I was just literally an average student. And then I was fortunate enough to do my IGCSEs in Oshawa, still in Mombasa. And you know, I also scored an average of a B. And so, I, before I even continue, I just wanna tell people like, education is important, but it's not really the highlight of how your life is going to turn out to be. Um, I was a very naughty and mischievous girl. Um, I used to speak my mind. I used to say things that would make even my community and my family very uncomfortable. And I used to have a mind of my own. Um, I experienced bullying as a child and uh, what else and you know here and there was a drama queen from time to time <laughs> you know i've always had something up my sleeve um and i did my bachelor's and master's in malaysia and germany so but i used to always come back home now whenever i come back home i had this idea of really just bringing women young women together um, teaching them how to speak well, but at the same time creating events that will empower them when it comes to fashion, when it comes to food, nutrition and health. And so I did a couple of those. I remember my first gig I did, I was just targeting 30 people and 75 women from Mombasa ended up coming. So you can imagine like this is Mombasa, Arab Swahili culture, but people are like, they were curious to know. But the good thing out of it, and I think that's very memorable to me, is that from that 75, then it, the network grew. So now I started identifying different topics that I would uh, speak to women and young, and young children. And I realized one of the very basic issue was GBV, gender-based violence and sexual-based violence, and mental health. And so I focused on that. So I used to do small mentorship groups, I used to do small events. And so from there, I branched out and started focusing on gender-based violence, I started focusing on sexual-based violence, mental health, and really uh, public speaking in our society. And so I started having small mentorship groups for young people and women. I remember I used to also go to like people, women's homes, like married women who cannot come to where we are. I used to go to their homes. I used to teach them about empowering them. I used to MC. I remember my first gig, I got 2,500 shillings. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, it was a mompreneur event um, and they gave me a chance to really MC for them. And so it grew. From that, it grew up to be now a network that I was reaching out to people. And then I moved from there to uh, Swahili Port Hub. That's where I was training young people when it comes to public speaking skills. But I was also being mentored by Mahmoud Noor, who is the mentor there. And he was able to help me understand how I can now brand myself into becoming a person who is good for the society and someone who's positive. And so I think that's what really built me because from a very young age, I was very vocal. Um, I've always had aspirations to either go into the humanitarian side of life or to become a communicator across Africa. 
my two main legends are late Kofi Annan and Oprah Winfrey. And these are the two things that have driven me to become who I am. And I think it's what's helping me. The fact that I have experience for, from the community-based level, it actually helped me to become a better person as a national government official because I understand the struggles of people and I understand how you can actually simplify information and make someone feel like you are part of a solution rather than being the problem. Nadia Ahmed Abdallah have been appointed a Chief Administrative Secretary in the Government of Kenya. Do swear that I will at all times be faithful to the Republic of Kenya. If I can paint a picture of my personality, I grew up in a blended family. Now let me explain what that means. That means that there's a mother, there's a father, then the parents divorce and then the parents move on to a different partner. And so I was raised by my stepfather and my late mom and uh, so far we are two in the family and of course we are an extended family so we consider cousins and you know everyone being family uh, the extended family is quite big uh, i'm the first born um, so I'm a, I'm a very you know leader leader let's just say i'm a leader but at the same time i'm very also bubbly and fun um, my family is quite conservative but at the same time they groomed this type of child so i'm not sure how the conservativeness and uh, the liberalism how it's merged but then it, it brought me and so my childhood dream has always been to be the secretary general of the united nations i'm still working towards that dream um, because i just love how humanitarianism changes people's lives and that's one thing that i really have a goal to aspire to be I feel like we can use a lot of our culture, a lot of our foundations to actually mold things and make peace with different places. Um, I, I really have a strong interest when it comes to building the childhood foundation and really empowering the girl child because I still believe there's a lot of work to be done, even in my position as who I am. And being from a marginalized community, I've seen how there's still lack of information and lack of opportunities out there that need to reach young people, that need to reach young women, and that really need to reach children. And so it, it's really a passion of mine, together with mental health, because I do believe that if you want a healthy society, if you want a healthy world, um, you really have to invest in mental health. And so ever since I started working in national government, I have been advocating for it, though I've been an advocate for mental health since 2016. And then also the element of Pan-Africanism. I just feel like as Africans, we need to now look beyond our countries. We need to see what other countries are doing and really put that together so that we can, we can grow. Because as a continent, the median age is still 19. The percentage of young people in Africa is 60%. So I feel like if we work together as Africans, we'll really be able to change our countries in the different dynamics. So yeah, that's, that's a, I'm a pot full of aspirations. So I was, again, fortunate enough to study abroad. Um, I did my bachelor's in public relations and communication with a minor in journalism in uh, Malaysia at a university called Taylor's University Lakeside Campus. Um, and then from there, I actually worked in a PR agency. It was an American PR agency based in, um, in Malaysia. And a fun fact is that actually my accounts were um, automotives and aerospace and missiles system so you can imagine <laughs> looking back I'm, I'm looking at myself and I'm like oh my god my first job was actually very heavy because I had to do their PR and media relations on that side um, but then I also did a lot of events so I was like a semi influencer kind of thing in in Malaysia l really leveraging on the fact that I'm from Kenya and my passion for events and, and fashion so I used to do a lot of pieces uh, really transcribing events and talking about my experience then writing it on my blog and then also earning money from that in fact it was it was going on so well that i was invited to indonesia i used to attend fashion weeks and i went to indonesia and i was part of different fashion weeks that were there in malaysia as well so i did a lot of these side gigs where i would get some money here and there and i leveraged on the fact that i can write very well because i'm a writer 
Um, and then from there, I actually moved to Germany and I did my master's in international relations and cultural diplomacy, which is a lot of foreign policy stuff as well. And I remember in, uh, I was in Berlin. In Berlin, I started a small business where I used to create gift box boxes. So if it's Christmas, I put in Christmas box uh, stuff inside and then I sell them for like five euros, 10 euros. Um, and then I published my first book actually in Berlin in 2017. Um, it was called uh, The Feminist in Us. Now, this book was a research book. Basically, I took um, ideas from 25 people across the world to ask them why is it that feminism does not work and how can we incorporate African feminism to our own. So this was also an extension of my thesis that I was doing because I wrote a thesis about African feminism in Kenya, how it affects women socially, politically and economically. And so I did that, um, but at the same time I continued writing. I did a few copywriting gigs um, that I got and I was earning from it on the side. Then I came back to Kenya and I started my own uh, network. It was called Fierce Lady Official Network. And so it was a network just to empower young people and women across the country. I think the fact that um, I'm representing a demography that I managed to earn their trust. So the young people see me as their friend, see me as their counterpart. Uh, they see me as their leader, but they see me as someone they can relate to rather than seeing me as like a, a demigod like that. So I think that's amazing. The other highlight would be the fact that I managed to launch a very strong campaign 10 months into my job called Kenya Ni Mimi um, and managed to be able to manage 53 ambassadors across the country. I think that also is an extremely important highlight. But also I think the fact that I managed to really represent young people very well and still be supported and still be mentored by also like my cabinet secretary and everyone that is close to me and around. I think that's, that's a very strong highlight. And I think the growth, the growth that comes uh, with the job, um, I think it's important because now I have a better understanding on how government works. I have a better understanding to actually tell people that this is how it is and if you want to get some certain opportunities you have to go through this this and that so i think those are like my major major highlights because uh, the nadia that was sewn in on 17th january 2020 and the nadia now 2022 are totally different people and i think one of my biggest lessons is to really be ready to listen and be corrected a lot of us millennials, at times, we do not want to listen. We, yes, we have our ideas and we know that they can work, but sometimes you actually need an, an extra ear to listen to what it's going to cost or to listen to how you can go about it and make something much, much greater out of it. Being corrected, we are not perfect, no one is perfect. So when you're corrected, um, it really just means that someone's trying to help you elevate. Constructive criticism is actually good for your career growth and even good for your lifestyle growth as well. Another lesson is not everyone is going to like you. So the perception that I had was, oh my God, you know, I'm young. So because there was a demand for a young person to be in government, then here I was. And then I thought everybody would really like accept me and like me because it's a fresh flavor coming in. But then shock on me, I realized that that's not the case. So. I think I've learned how to accept that there's a certain group of people who will not like me and that's okay. It's not that they don't like me because I'm me. It's just a reflection of what they would wish to either have or a reflection of this different frustration they have as well. The other thing is that when you're in a space with different demographics, don't try to really outshine other people. Actually just try to learn the environment, try to, um, take in the ecosystem that is there and then try to identify the people that you really resonate with and really learn from them because that's how it will do because for me one of the people that is my biggest mentor is actually my cabinet secretary and I'm not saying this because he's my CS but it's because I have seen the platform that he has put me on and I've seen the opportunities that he always brings my way and it's actually built my whole personality and career not only outside but also within government and the last thing is confidence a lot of us Millennials lack confidence we are loud we are loud we want to be heard but there's a difference between being loud and actually being confident about the content that you have 
most of us lack content and we lack content because we are in a, we are in an environment or a world where it's a microwave generation so try to invest in your information trying to invest in your knowledge so that when you're challenged by someone you confidently give out substantive output rather than just being loud and being heard about it millennials um, being one of them and I'll tell you is that we forget that just like happiness sadness disappointment heartbreaks are also part of emotions and we forget that these are also things we have to go through life is a circle you can't always be happy you can't always achieve different things now the mistake that we make is that when we go through sadness when we go through depression or when we go we have anxiety or panic we suppress those things we suppress those things because that's what our uh, culture has taught us so that's what the african society makes us believe in and then also seek help you know getting a therapist or even speaking to someone and i know sometimes uh, psychiatrists or therapists are expensive but also have that one confidant because talking about your situation helps a lot when it comes to depression unless it's a very extreme case that's when you need psychiatric help but the ones that we go through from day to day life speak to someone learn how to journal write about it alafu to jikubali tu ikwa yani mambo ni mabaya ni mabaya jikubali because that's the only way you're going to pass through it So the lowest moment in my life was when I lost my mom four months into being appointed as a CAS. Um, before being appointed, she was battling with cervical cancer, and after I got appointed, um, you know, her health deteriorated and she passed away. I actually thought I would not be able to do my job properly, but you know what? I think she's my guardian. Not I think she's my guardian angel right now, and I do have my low moments as well from time to time. But I think what keeps me going is continuing building her legacy so that she can be proud of me. There is somebody I am seeing, but I'm not married yet because I believe in the institution of marriage. And can I date a broke guy? I believe brokenness is a state of mind. If I meet you and you're able to challenge me intellectually and I can see that you have a goal moving forward, why not give you a chance because I was broke one day. I think I'm still in the middle between still making my own and securing the bag and still being broke at times.